Okay, folks, so it's time for the Q&A with Joanna and Marlon. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's start by thanking the speakers again. Those are two awesome talks. And there's a couple of microphones that are strategically placed in the room. So if you guys could stampede in a hopefully orderly fashion towards the microphone so you can, uh, we can ask the questions. And um, we'll take one question from each microphone. Um, I guess uh, before uh, people have a chance to, um, you know, uh, formulate their questions, I have one. So how do you guys uh, think that uh, the cold start problem can be solved for a subject within your respective frameworks? So sometimes you have absolutely no data for a subject. And, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I can give you the vanilla answers, which is if you have some population proxy, we, we start with that. Uh, then we get some data. If we have some, uh, you know, analytical model of what might happen, we might start with that. I think my my sound is gone, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, but uh, I don't know that there is actually a, a really good fundamental. Um, in the behavioral space, um, you know, part of the reason. The reason we're trying to look at um, different kinds of state inferences is to get state variables that, let's say, behavioral scientists have been reasoning about for a long time. So maybe they have theories about how things behave, and you can bootstrap uh, an initial run um, by taking a behavioral theory and reasoning out how you think things might work and try to get some initial bounds on parameter values and things like that, um, and then run from there. So that, that's what I was saying. I mean, working with domain experts is really important. In this case, maybe you know, behavioral, behaviorists don't necessarily have really good dynamic theories that describe how, the dynamics of processes, but they might know things about you know, directional relationships between different kinds of constructs and things like that. You can start from there. Um, and then it, the um, methodology around JIDA is starts with a tuning trial called a micro-randomized trial, which it, it is a way of gathering data, but it's a, it's a fully uh, exploration-based trial design. And so there's typically the stacking process where you go from be behavioral theory um, to bootstrap from nothing into an MRT where you collect some initial data, but without actually having a policy that is um, running using RL. And then you use that to get a better sense of um, a starting point and run an RL trial from there. And that's the trajectory that a number of projects have been working on taking. And this is like a multi-year multi and sometimes multi-grant kind of trajectory to get something off the ground. Question? Yeah, is this on? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Great. So thank you both for the wonderful talks. This question is um, specifically for Doina, but I'd love to hear both your thoughts. Um, with respect to your work on blood glucose management, uh, a lot of the techniques that you're looking at are model-free approaches. You've highlighted sample efficiency as a limitation or an issue or challenge, and I'm wondering if you've been thinking about model-based approaches, and if not, what are you thinking about um, to solve this problem? Yeah, that's actually a, a great question, and exactly what uh, Shimana is currently working on is model-based approaches. Um, because as you're pointing out, in model-based, where you're learning a, a model of the patient, uh, maybe that can be reused, and, and the sample efficiency can be much better. The main difficulty right now has actually been in finding modeling. Um, and so a lot of the work currently that, that she is doing is in terms of fitting reliable models, which we can use in a planning loop without, uh, without getting error snowballing. And so I think a lot of the time, in, in, and there's, there's two interesting challenges there. One is the model being accurate in the places that are actually useful for the policy. So it doesn't have to be accurate overall, but how do we sort of uh, propagate that information well? And then the other challenge has been, what's the right way of doing planning? And we've been exploring Monte Carlo style planning compared to value iteration and other sample-based planning methods. But I think in the end, that will be a better answer than what we're doing now. Thank you, I'd love to talk more. Yes. Okay, I think we have another. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Marlin. Uh, specifically, it was about uh, for hab habituation uh, for a correctly tailored response. Um, I was wondering if there's some risk in kind of the, the opposite, where if a correctly tailored response is always given, the subject or patient can become kind of over-reliant on the message and 
will say only uh, do an intervention when they get a message, even if they should sometimes be doing it otherwise? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, the example dynamics that we're writing down, there, there are lots of different ways that you could frame that out. There are, there are a couple there where you could make different kinds of decisions. So I think the decision for habituation basically was to, you know, the, the habituation increment in, in that simulator is the same um, regardless of what the message type was and whether the contextualization was correct or not. Um, and that's, that's something, again, where maybe you could do something, uh, certainly do something more um, nuanced and sort of look at the effects. So I think, um, and the same thing with the disengagement risk. There's a decision there around um, what to do when there's a non-tailored message and so on. So um, the, the way the system is set up, there's a, a set of hyperparameters that basically control all of these effects. And I think what, we're, what we were most interested in there was trying to understand how robust some of these effects are to different kinds of assumptions. So um, at, you know, uh, if you look at a population version of this, right, we, um, you could put priors over top of all of these parameters and then sample different settings. And then you, your different environments basically correspond to different people who might behave in different ways. Um, and you could do a, a version of this where um, you look at applying the same um, RL processes but with respect to a population of individuals that are providing different environments that behave somewhat differently within um, some defined space. So that's a perfectly reasonable thing to have in scope, right? It's a potential kind of effect that you might see. And of course, in the behavioral space, behavior is very varied. Um, people might behave in very different ways. Um, and so um, looking at what that variability looks like um, and trying to capture it in different ways is something that's very important. So thank you. Thank you. Um, no, no, th oh, there we go. I've got a question for Doina. I wanted to ask about the, a little bit more about the effect of DQN versus DQN side of your talk. Because um, I think, you know, I totally agree that patients are fundamentally partially observable. Um, and it seems obvious that effect of DQN would be outperforming something like DQN because it's getting access to more information than, than DQN has. Do you think it would have added more if you had extended the observation set available to DQN to having something like downward or increasing trend of glucose, even as just one additional observation, and to what extent does that either bolster or reduce the significance of having you know, prolonged action effect, you know, that mathematical framework versus simply having a, a broader set of observations that captures relevant history? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we did not... Um, add the delta from the previous uh, glucose level. Um, we sort of use this ADRQN as a way of incorporating history sort of in an extensive format because there you have an LSTM. We did try at some point using just the history of actions, so the state plus which, uh, which doses have been uh, administered before. But if you're using a fixed length history approach, you oftentimes actually miss the dose because it was too early. And so that did not make any significant difference compared, uh, compared to DQN. But that's a really good point, and that's something that probably we should try uh, as, an extra, as an extra baseline. I think, in general, of course, the more history information you incorporate in principle, uh, the better you can be. Uh, part of the challenge is also, uh, I think, how you summarize that information uh, so that you have, uh, in, in some ways, I think of what we did as maybe a, a domain-inspired summarization of the information, and that's where the power is really coming from. Otherwise, you know, the algorithm is still, is still DQN. Um, and there's a question of, you know, maybe these deltas in, in the blood glucose would also offer some, some useful summary. But if you don't summarize at all, actually, uh, it's hard to make things um, be efficient enough. Because I think we're probably... This is, there we go. I think we're probably approaching the same problem from different ends, which is that definitely physiology is Markovian. You know, it's not violating time causality. You know, you have an action now and an effect now, and then there's some latent state that we can't measure. So the dose that was given an hour ago is affecting s some latent parameter that's present now, and we can't measure that. Um, and I guess, yeah, it's, I find it interesting the question of whether to address that from the conditional previous action set versus trying to capture that latent state using whether it's, you know, a neural network or something else. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And I think the you know, what works better may unfortunately be problem dependent, I guess we'll, we'll see. Thank you. Uh, hello. 
I have uh, two questions. So the, the first one is about safety. Uh, if you could both comment on, uh, so for example, on the adaptive interventions uh, context, optimizing for engagement is a kind of tricky sometimes, no? Like how do we know that the uh, patient or the, the individual will not be just more hung over the phone and just be dependent? And in the context of uh, diabetes, say, uh, you have an unconventional, unconventional patient, how do you know that the algorithm will not just uh, cause damage? That's the first question. And the second question, more for uh, Doina. So um, uh, how far are we from seeing uh, RL-based um, uh, drug, uh, personalized drug dosing in the clinic? And what would be the steps? Thank you. So maybe I'll start with the first part of the first question. Doina can pick it up from there. Um, so with respect to engagement and the behavioral side, so engagement's a fairly complicated construct, as I was describing. Um, there's also a question of sort of engagement with what, um, similar with salience, like salience of what. Um, so with engagement, there are sort of two pieces that sometimes get conflated. So, <clears throat> so one is engagement with the sort of intervention technology itself. So if you're doing an app-mediated intervention, then you can look at, and something you can measure is how much are people using the app, and you can say that's sort of engagement with the intervention app. Or if you can see people look, you know, if they're opening the messages that you sent to them, you can say that's engagement with um, the intervention. And of course, what we actually care about is engagement with the health behaviors, right? We don't actually, it doesn't actually um, matter in some sense if people are looking at, the, uh, looking at the app or looking at the messages. What we want is for people, let's say, to increase their walking behavior, okay? So if they can do that in a way where they no longer need your app, that's fine, right? You've achieved the goal. Um, so what's happening in the early stages of these, these interventions, the use of the, the therapeutic technology is scaffolding the health behavior, and eventually if people are engaging in the health behavior and not engaging in the use of the technology, that's fine. Um, and so you just have to be a little bit careful when you look at what, what facet of engagement are we looking at and what part of it are we measuring. What we really care about is health behaviors. Maybe um, the, there's a proxy involving use of technology, but they're not the same thing, and we really want one and not the other. So I think that's, that's part of how that grounds out. Dana. Yeah, the safety issue is a, is a really good question. And, you know, of course, on the technical side, there's been an increasing amount of work on RL algorithms that are specifically tailored to, for example, not just optimize for return, but take into account variants, um, you know, incorporate constraints. Uh, so constraint MDPs is a really nice framework actually for, for doing that. And so I think on the technical side, that's absolutely necessary for some of these practical applications for sort of linking also to deployment. At the end of the day, uh, there's always mistakes. And so there has to be a clinician in the loop. I don't think that we can expect just automated deployment, for example, of, of some of these algorithms uh, without oversight from a clinician. So the way that I think about it, for example, in the blood glucose example, is um, we can provide a tool to a clinician to say, here's a policy, right? Here is how we would tailor for this specific patient and then that clinician maybe can also provide further input, right? Can comment on it. And then we could, in principle, incorporate that data through, uh, you know, some amount of behavior cloning or regularization towards, uh, towards these examples. In terms of deployment of these methods in the clinic, I think uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges to deploy any kind of machine learning in the clinic, as, as far as I can tell. Even when we tried with, with supervised learning methods, you basically need to have a really tight collaboration loop and clinicians that are very open to uh, adopting these methods and an electronic system uh, in the clinic that's already well developed and, and integrates all the sources of information that are needed. So that's, that's one aspect of it which can be challenging. Um, but of course the, the other aspects that, that are challenging are evaluating these protocols, especially in the case where these are learned policies, evaluating them in a real context with real patients as opposed to just in simulation. And uh, I've done historically a lot of work in, in of policy learning, for example, where we try to leverage batch data in order to do these evaluations. But at the end of the day, there is uh, you know, nothing like actually running things uh, in, in a true context and understanding uh, what happens there. I think in, the, in some way the good news is that some of this groundwork and understanding how to do evaluations is now done in the uh, RL from human feedback community for language models, right? So they face a very similar uh, problem. They train with 
batch data, then they actually want to know how this works with people. Of course, maybe the risk is a little bit lower, but I think some of the evaluation protocols that people are thinking of in that literature may eventually make their way into uh, the, the clinical context as well. It'll be a space that I'm, I'm quite curious about, but right now, evaluation is a huge piece. We can't really have enough confidence in automatedly um, sort of created policies to really deploy without any form of oversight. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a follow-up question, sort of like that's related to the discussion that was just happening. So one of the hallmarks of uh, RL is the uh, exploration versus exploitation um, trade-off. Now, in, in certain studies, for example, if you're doing, you know, um, changing the, the behavior of, via nudges, this is feasible. In other studies, it doesn't seem so feasible. Uh, I mean, in some sense, it's risky, perhaps even unethical to say, let's try this. Um, also, from my experience, clinicians are often averse to exploration, even if it's within clinical guidelines. So my question is, how would you uh, sort of, like, like, like perhaps you could comment on this and, and, and comment on the, let's say, the potential of actually RL being adopted in clinical practice? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just start to, as a rejoinder to the previous comments as well, I think the, so the safety issues as you were just describing in the behavioral space when you're looking at things like um, goal setting and planning, app use, nudges, um, obviously those are much lower stakes uh, intervention components, and so you can afford to do things like exploration, you can be wrong. The, the, um, sort of worst thing that can happen in a lot of these interventions um, is disengagement, like I was describing. So the person disengages from the intervention and you lose all future therapeutic potential. Um, but no, like people aren't gonna die, right, <laughs> as a result of this. So it's not, it's not an issue like medication titration where you have toxicity issues that could be really severe. Um, so that, so you know, it's an interesting space to develop these kinds of methods in because you do, the safety issues are not as, uh, not as significant. Um, it's also the case in behavioral science that beha behaviorists are used to running these kinds of experiments. So I was describing the different interventions, sense to stop and heart steps. So these are trials that have run in the field um, with limited numbers of participants. Heart steps ran with 100 people for a year each um, over the course of about two years. And so we get you know, really good and interesting data out of running those kinds of studies. Um, and again, the same thing with sense to stop. It was run in an MRT mode, so sort of full exploration, but conditioning it's not random exploration, it's conditioning on uh, context. So you can get a sense for how well context inferences are working, you can get a sense of how people are um, sort of uh, engaging with different facets of the intervention component. So there's, uh, there's definitely more leeway. I agree that um, the clinical space in terms of, again, interventions like medication titration and so on, are the, sa the safety issues are much more significant. So I'll pass it up to Tony to talk about that. Yeah, I think, so uh, part of the answer is using simulation because there we can do exploration without, without penalties. And so we can't really eliminate either simulation or having extensive batch data from previous policies. And you know, one approach is to take that data, learn a model, and then essentially use that model as, as a simulator in order to, to do the exploration. Um, it's very tricky to deploy exploratory policies in practice. It can be extremely useful in order to assess and so, and, and I believe that it can be done safely if things are kept within sort of clear clinical guidelines. The piece of whether clinicians will buy it or not is, is quite a different story, right? And I think that's where you really need to have um, very good buy-in um, from, from colleagues and, and people that, uh, you know, essentially trust enough in the algorithm and the team in order to, uh, to do this. And you know, to be frank, that my experience has been that even in simpler cases, that has been necessary. So even, for example, for the NICU supervised learning uh, experiments that we did, we wanted to simply gather data you know, with the existing apparatus, nothing new, just to fit algorithms. And the response from clinicians has been quite mixed in the sense that some people were very enthusiastic, other people signed in but never actually uh, sort of got data from any patients for us, and some people were sort of almost hostile to us being present there at all because there was a bit of a feeling of, oh, you know, we're monitoring what they do or, you know, there's gonna be some kind of repercussions. And so I think the sort of socialization aspect is really important, and for that, there need to be actual collaborators that are on the ground 
uh, that helps us understand the situation and, and uh, will support uh, these, these explorations. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I had a, a question for both of you. Um, so, uh, so from friends from, from McGill and Université de Montréal, in, in, in the clinic, uh, we often teach uh, something called the art of medicine, where it's kind of uh, the feeling of the patient and the feeling of the setting, and that's going to uh, affect quite a lot the, uh, the outcome that's going to be actually labeled, labeled for the patient. And all this work with uncertainties, I think it's very important, because modeling this often requires unsupervised tasks, for example, relabeling using unsupervised techniques. And I was wondering how RL could potentially leverage um, all the, the ability of the, the network to learn that uncertainty, to potentially standardize the prediction. Uh, I know in cancer it's a huge issue. Stage four can be stage four in one hospital, hospital be a stage three in the other, because there's a feeling with the patient, the way that the, the conversation went with the pathologist. So I was wondering what you thought that uh, how RL could potentially leverage um, the learning abilities of, of ORL to make better predictions with, uh, in that setting. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a great question. Um, so I'll say on, from, from my perspective, um, you know, we, we know for a fact that the aspects of state that we're assessing um, and the interventions that have been developed um, so far don't capture the kind of nuance that you're describing, and it's definitely a problem. And so you know, at the end of a year-long trial, when you do a post-intervention um, you know, post uh, interview with people and you ask them, um, you know, how did you think things went, um, that's the kind of feedback that you get. They're like, well, the system seemed to understand some aspects of things that were going on, but then there were other things that happened um, you know, that the system didn't, didn't pick up on. And then the, the kind of personalization is just sort of, there are gaps in what the systems are seeing, what they're assessing, and then what they're using. Um, and it's built in. We, we, we know for a fact that there are, you know, there are variables that we're not trying to capture. Um, and so that happens with like major life events, for example, in the behavioral side, when you're looking at a year-long uh, setup, right? So someone could have you know, a, a major life event. Uh, we ran heart steps in the middle of COVID, so and people were getting COVID in the middle of the trial. Um, we had a questionnaire that went out periodically where we were asking about things like this. So did you have significant sickness? But there, there's a time lag. So we were maybe doing that once a month for a year. But if, you know, if someone ends up with COVID and they're, you know, they're um, uh, in isolation for some period of time, um, then there's going to be some lag before we actually get that information, right? And so then the system doesn't have that important information. It might be prompting you to do things that now aren't feasible, right? And so <clears throat> it becomes jarring when maybe it was reasonable, but now it's become unreasonable. Um, so that, that issue of just how do, you, how do you pick up on more nuanced state and then how do you use it um, is a really important problem. Um, I think, as, as you saw from my talk, I think uncertainty is really key. It comes in at multiple levels. Um, this question of um, you know, thinking about model-based RL as well um, uh, and looking at sort of model-based RL in a way that reflects all kinds of uncertainty, including Bayesian, Bayesian uncertainty about model parameters is something um, that's potentially helpful as well. So I think something from the Terry learning perspective, just because of the way those dynamics work, minimizing the propensity for overconfidence is something that's important because of this idea of building trust, right? So you can, you know, you can do something reasonable for a while, but if you have a trust-violating event that occurs, then it's like maybe all bets are off. So um, that kind of uncertainty management is important from that perspective of making sure that the recommendations you're making aren't just safe, but um, people will find them trustworthy over time. So they'll um, sort of uh, follow the recommendations of a system like this. And I think also human in the loop could be very, very helpful. Yep. Um, I know clinicians are quite aversive to innovation, um, but uh, I think uh, it would be really, really helpful because when we work with clinician, uh, being one myself, I, I feel like a lot of them are fearful of technology, uh, losing their jobs or losing the, the power they have. But I think um, leveraging human loop, especially in the setting of RL, could really help all those variation that we see in supervised data. Uh, that is honestly quite horrible sometimes, uh, but could be very, very helpful to standardize uh, algorithms that are sometimes not, the tasks are not necessarily very hard, but the labels are so noisy that it's impossible to actually complete the task correctly. But that would be really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's, uh, we have time for one more question, so please. I'll save the best for last. OK. <laughs> well, thank you for your talk. Um, so I have a little bit of a different take from the, uh, just the, the, this last question. Um, I would say that the primary problem for clinician adoption it's not explainability, it's not interpretability, it's actually learning something new about the design of the system, R regardless of whatever system that we are seeking to optimize. And I think from my perspective, uh, reinforcement learning has been great for optimizing functions, 
where we have a very specific type of schedule. Physiologic optimization, a lot of the hesitancy, I think, comes from clinicians having this recognition that we don't have a complete understanding of a individual, for example, and that, you know, that over time, the clinical trial may end up having a benefit when reproduced has a null benefit. So there's a real hesitancy in, in terms of our understanding of a dynamic system where even if a, a machine learning algorithm may give you an answer, it, it still has an inherent you know, mistrust. So I'm, the question for you is, how do you, can you envision re reinforcement learning being used to understand dynamics of the system properties in a non-Markovian you know, design? So uh, I, th I think um, that's, in fact, one I actually think there is a lot of potential on the reinforcement learning, sort of basic reinforcement learning study to think about what happens when we don't really have Markovian assumptions, you know, to what extent can we estimate state uncertainty, like, like Ben was talking about earlier, to what extent can we infer latent variables that maybe explain the dynamics in a Markovian way, like when is that possible? And there is a lot of, like on the algorithmic side, there's been a lot of explorations and there's actually quite a bit that's been done in sort of the control area uh, that, that can be leveraged. Um, the part of the problem when, with, with the medical domain is that we don't really have observationally all the measurements that we need often. Um, you know, we don't have rich sensory streams. Uh, there's a lot of missing observations and a better way of leveraging that would be, would be very useful. Um, but so I think a lot of it really is actually on the algorithmic community to come up with, with better ways, for example, of, of doing latent uh, state inference. Now, you know, one of the challenges, to be very blunt, is the way that the research is evaluated in the machine learning community right now. So it's, you know, to get a paper accepted that has a medical application, to get it accepted at ICML or NURBS is a lot harder than to get a paper accepted if I'm, you know, if I'm doing some kind of video game. Um, and so I, I feel like that's also something that we need to, on the machine learning side, work on as a community to really get people to engage with these applications that are in some ways a lot more challenging um, and a little bit different in nature and, and really focus on that. Okay, thank you for your questions and let's thank the speakers again.